Have you ever gotten into an argument that you just couldn't win? Did it feel like the other person was using some deceptive tactics to try to persuade you? Well, there's a good chance that they were using logical fallacies, whether they knew it or not. Hi, I'm Rich Burnett for Wondrium, and in this episode of Perspectives, a handful of experts will show you how to identify logical fallacies and how to argue against them. We start off with a general overview of what a fallacy is, and then we discuss a thought experiment that asks, what's more likely to kill you, your dog or your couch? Enjoy. A logical fallacy is a flaw in reasoning that leads to a faulty conclusion. Logical fallacies often appear reasonable on the surface, Sometimes they're true errors in thinking, but when used in a prepared speech, they're usually deliberate attempts to mislead or manipulate the audience. In that situation, they're designed to make the audience think that the speaker's logic is sound, but in fact, the speaker is muddying the logic or misusing pathos through baseless emotional appeals. It is not terribly important that you remember the names of each of these fallacies and let you want to trot them out to impress your friends. But it is worthwhile to be able to notice when a conclusion does not logically follow and to be able to say why. Law students spend three years learning how to do this. Being able to do this makes them into better lawyers. And if you can do it too, you will be a more persuasive speaker. Let's turn to another category of logical fallacies. And to do this, let me ask you a question. Which do you think is more likely to kill you, your dog or your couch? And when I ask my law students this, they say their couch because they figure this must be a trick question. Instinct tells most of us that the dog is more dangerous, but my law students are right to be suspicious. Data shows that you're 30 times more likely to die from falling off furniture in your own house than you are to be killed by a dog. The point is, though, most of us are going to answer this question based on how quickly examples spring into our minds. Maybe we second guess that impulse like my law students do, but for most humans, it feels right that an event is more probable if examples come to mind quickly and easily. That is a logical fallacy called the availability heuristic. The availability heuristic operates on the notion that if something springs to mind easily, it must be important, or at least more important than alternatives that are not as readily recalled. People are unreasonably afraid of astronomically rare shark attacks because of the availability heuristic. The reality is you should be more afraid of almost anything than you are of sharks because almost anything is more likely to kill you than a shark is. Here are a few lists of things that, according to official death statistics, kill more people every year than sharks, in no particular order. You ready? Obesity, texting, lightning, hippos, airplanes, deer, icicles, hot dogs, volcanoes, falling out of bed, bathtubs, shopping on Black Friday, dogs, ants, jellyfish, tornadoes, playing high school football, roller coasters, and vending machines. On a more serious note, surveys indicate that Americans feel less safe now than they have in the past. In 2015, a Pew Research Center survey asked Americans if gun violence in the country had increased, decreased, or stayed the same, over the previous 20 years, since the mid-90s. More than half of participants said that gun crimes had increased. Another 26% said that gun violence had stayed the same. Both of these groups were wrong, and not by a little bit. In point of fact, gun violence in the U.S. had dropped by half. The gun homicide rate went from 7 in 100,000 in 1993 to 3.6 in 100,000 in 2010. But not only were the people surveyed not aware of these improvements, many people, half of them, drew exactly the wrong conclusion about the state of violent crime in the US. Why? Well, the availability heuristic is one reason. 
Given the way violent incidents are reported in the internet age, immediately, repeatedly, and vividly, people naturally think that these events are more likely than they actually are. The availability heuristic can lead us to make all kinds of suboptimal decisions, from purchasing too much insurance to not allowing our kids to play unsupervised. Another illogical fallacy that operates similarly to the availability heuristic is confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is the tendency to look for things that confirm what you already believe and to disregard everything else. It's similar to the availability heuristic in that it's making your own pre-existing beliefs paramount. You want your belief to be true, so you look for evidence that confirms that idea and either ignore other evidence or stop gathering additional evidence. The confirmation bias captures the fact that your beliefs and opinions are based on cherry-picked data, years or even decades of situations in which evidence that confirms them grabbed your attention while disconfirming evidence was ignored. It's why sometimes when you learn a new fact or become engrossed in some topic, elements of that theme seem to follow you everywhere. You get excited about electric cars, for instance, and only then do you notice all the charging stations on your way to work that you hadn't seen before. Or if you're a woman trying to get pregnant, you see babies and other pregnant women everywhere, and you wonder if the world really is becoming overpopulated. The confirmation bias is especially rampant in political debates, where candidates cherry-pick data points to support their policies, rather than creating policies based on all the data. The climate science debate will go down in history as a prime example. For every new study demonstrating the link between human activity and climate change, deniers point to one data point or two showing that parts of the Earth are cooler now than in the past. For example, more snow in winter on the East Coast is used by climate change deniers as proof that the Earth is cooling while, in fact, scientists know that the increased precipitation is a predicted effect of warming ocean currents. Rather than looking at all the data and trying to understand how counterintuitive effects can result from global warming, deniers grab hold of bits of information that, on the surface, seem to confirm their opinion. Part of the reason that these types of fallacies can be so difficult to debate is because they are based on research. Sometimes there are flaws in the research itself, but most of the time it's when people move from evidence to extrapolation that they start to use argument fallacies. There is a lot of evidence that there have been harsh winters in recent years. This is a quantifiable claim that we can all research. We can compare precipitation rates and temperatures to show that when winter arrives, it can be a very nasty season. That is evidence that very few people could disagree with and very few scientists would say is flawed. So far, so good. The problem is when we take that evidence and then draw out an implication that says that global warming must be a hoax. Because look outside at how cold it is. Look at outside at how much snow there is on the ground. That move to try to use the evidence to support the claim that global warming is a hoax is where the fallacy kicks in. Climate change does not mean that all of the Earth loses all of its seasons and just turns into one hot planet for everyone. So how does a skilled debater counter these persuasive fallacies? It is not enough to point out that they represent a flaw in reasoning or logic. In my experience, you have to attack one of them based on what makes them persuasive while simultaneously presenting your own evidence that combats the general claim they are defending. Arguing against slippery slope fallacies is extremely difficult. Why? Because slippery slope fallacies use fear to motivate the audience to imagine the worst case scenarios rather than use empirical data or expert opinion to make reasoned judgments. The only way to beat the slippery slope fallacy is to point it out and then to break the presumed sequence of events needed to establish the worst case scenario. In the case of the bathroom predator myth, it is extremely hard to do because of the fearful image of a predator dressing up as a woman and sneaking into a bathroom. The power of this fallacy cannot be understated. It is extremely difficult to conquer fears such as this and move the audience towards a more reasoned understanding of the issue. 
tap into people's fears with a slippery slope fallacy, and the other side has a huge task to identify the fallacy and debunk it. A corollary to the slippery slope fallacy is the false dilemma. A false dilemma occurs when a person argues that there are only two choices available to the audience when there may, in fact, be more than just two options available to them. By describing an issue as an either-or proposition, they limit the range of arguments available and create a false binary. In the context of the debate over bathroom use legislation, we find one major false dilemma. Proponents of limiting bathroom use according to the birth certificate gender identification created a binary between protecting transgender people and protecting innocent women. What was lost in the public debates was any discussion of doing something to prevent predators from attacking people in the first place. There was an acceptance on the part of the opponents of the protections for transgender people that predators exist and are waiting for the green light to start attacking women in bathrooms. Instead of figuring out what motivates predators and talking about ways to help prevent and catch them, the assumption was that predators were inevitable and therefore the audience had to choose between protecting this group, transgender people, or that group, women using public bathrooms. Of course, this is not the only fallacious line of reasoning people embrace. Consider, for example, when two things are correlated, when they happen at the same time, or one right before the other. What do we conclude? That one causes the other, right? Yet such reasoning is often fallacious. Correlation does not entail causation. Night always comes before day, but night doesn't cause day. Both are the effects of the Earth's rotation. The rate of violent crime always increases when ice cream sales increase. But ice cream does not cause or induce violence. The correlation is simply due to a common third factor, both spike in the summer. Such reasoning can even be dangerous. For example, autism has been diagnosed in some children shortly after they received the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine. But that doesn't mean that vaccines cause autism. It's simply the case that the age at which children's immune system are developed enough to receive the vaccine, well, that's around the same time that diagnosable signs of autism begin to appear. Yet, people have still concluded that vaccines are to blame and have stopped vaccinating their children. Consequently, many preventable diseases that were once all but eradicated are on the rise again. Such people are so convinced that nothing seems to be able to dissuade them. Not only have studies claiming the link been discredited, and not only have autism rates continued to rise, despite the fact that the su suspected culprit thimerosal was removed from the vaccine, and not only have studies showed that the rates of autism are the same among vaccinated and unvaccinated children, but doctors can often detect signs of autism before the administration of the MMR vaccine. What more proof do you need? And yet, when you point all this out, some people will still just say, but I know someone who got vaccinated and then was diagnosed with autism. Again, correlation does not entail causation. I know someone who put on a shirt and then was hit by a car. That doesn't mean anything. A correlation between two things might maybe be a reason to investigate whether there is a causal link between them. But once the investigation is done, if you don't find a link, that's it. Game over. Should we trust reason? Honestly, most of the time, we shouldn't trust instinctive reasoning. It's just not that reliable. It occasionally gets things right, but it always needs to be checked by careful reasoning, which can, in general, be trusted. It, in fact, is responsible for our advancement as a species. That's not to say that it's perfect. Even the most careful reasoning can get things wrong. But it doesn't have to be perfect to be trustworthy. We should never forget, however, that it can still go wrong. This is why you always want to check your careful reasoning for flaws. Make sure that no fallacious instinctive reasoning slipped in. Try to find errors. Even look for evidence that you're wrong. After all, how hard is it to confirm your beliefs if that's all you're trying to do? Anyone can find some evidence for anything. If you want to prove yourself right, Try to prove yourself wrong. 
Because if you try to prove yourself wrong and can't, it's a really good indication that you're right. Want to be even more assured? Invite others to prove you wrong. And remember, admit it when you are wrong. Hey, thanks for watching. If you'd like to learn more about any of the topics in this episode, the full list of series that these clips came from is in the description below. You can watch all the full series now on Wondrium.com. And don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel. Turn on notifications and you'll get an alert every time we post a new episode of Perspectives.